brothers and sisters, as you know, this Friday, those of you who are on the group, the word of God came to sister, my wife's sister again, and Mama Mary told her to have that penitential service for the Lenten season on Friday. It was all of a sudden. And um, as we had all the rosaries, all the decades of the rosaries, we had all the chaplets, we had uh, stations of the cross and so on. And during this, as we were having this, I got a vision from our Lord Jesus and Jesus came to me and He told me that we are, uh, the world is hated for the World War Three. It can happen anytime and uh, the World War Three will happen and uh, when this happens, a lot of the lot of the land which a lot of the land and this earth will become inhabitable will become inhabitable means people will, will be distracted and people will no longer be able to stay in these places most of it will be in america russia and many other countries mostly in india will be neutral but there will be we will also face a lot of problems like food shortages and, and etc and so on and uh, the Lord also showed me that uh, China will be the only country who will be the superpower after this. After everything is over, only China will remain as the superpower. And it is a dragon, it is a communist country. So there will be a lot of changes in the world. America will no longer be a superpower. Russia will also go down and China will be the only superpower in the world. And also a lot of uh, land on the earth will be submerged underwater. And will, so the place available for human beings to stay in this world, to inhabit the earth will be less, land will be less, water will become more. So that also is going to happen. So friends, just now coming back to my preaching, I'm going to preach about land. And the theme of the land, as you always know, is remember man that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Remember man. That you are dust and to dust you shall return. St. Paul tells us that it is appointed for men once to die and after that comes the judgment. Princesses, from Ash Wednesday onwards, we begin the season of Lent. Now what is Lent? Lent is the spiritual preparation for the Easter season. Just as we have Advent for Christmas, so we have Lent before Easter. As Jesus taught us very clearly that there is no resurrection without the cross and the season of Lent is the church's greatest spiritual journey as she along with the faithful as the bride of Christ joins the divine spouse in his great suffering. So what do we do? We join Jesus as being his partners and being Christians as we are called Christians which means Christ lives in us. So we join Jesus to remember his sufferings and we join every year in this 40 day journey in Jesus' great sufferings. Plainly speaking, you don't get the joy of Easter without the self-sacrifice of land. Many of our Catholics today in this age of technology, fast life, try to take easy way out of their responsibilities and their obligations towards God. There was someone who had come to us and he was telling us that, uh, you know, that uh, the person's boss, where the person was working, was also a Catholic. And he was telling that there is no need of fasting. That no way in the Bible is it mentioned that we have to fast. Brothers and sisters, so I'll just tell you where in the Bible it is written about this. In the book of Joel, prophet, uh, the book of prophet Joel, chapter one, verse fourteen, tells us: "Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land." to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And in chapter 2 of Joel, chapter 2 verse 12 to 13 tells us, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. 
So brothers and sisters, we are told in the Holy Bible to specifically fast, weep and mourn over our sins and to return to the Lord. Lent calls us to conversion, to be hot with the burning fire of love for God and not to be lukewarm. Jesus is a faithful friend who never abandons us. Even when we sin, he patiently awaits our return. Lent is a good season for deepening our spiritual life to the means of sanctification offered to us by the church through fasting, prayer and almsgiving. During this season, we are invited to hear and ponder over the word, over the word of God. Confession is one of the sacraments which is in the spotlight as we are encouraged by the church to confess our sins and return back to holiness in the commandment of God. No, brothers and sisters, the 40 day period of Lent is based on two episodes of spiritual testing in the Bible. The 40 days of roaming in the wilderness by the Israelites in the desert and the temptation of our Lord when he spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness. In the Bible, in the Holy Bible, the number 40 holds a special significance. During the flood of Noah, as you know, when God told Noah to make the ark, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Moses fasted on the mountain of Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights before God gave him the Ten Commandments. The spies who were sent to the land of Canaan to check the land by the Israelites, whether it was good enough for the people to go and to because the Canaanites were giants and they were huge people so the spies were sent to check the land and to see the weaknesses of the enemies they spent 40 days the prophet Elijah traveled for 40 days and 40 nights to reach the mountain of God in Sinai the Bible does not mention the custom of land However, the practice of repentance and mourning in ashes is found in 2 Samuel chapter 13 verse 19. But Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. So brothers and sisters, there are a lot of mentions but to cut it short, I will just put 2 Samuel. There is also from the book of Daniel. And then, in the New Testament, Jesus himself tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So, brothers, here we find in the Bible, in the Old as well as the New Testament, the importance of how we came to this um, season of land and to observe land. Early, early Christians felt the importance of Easter and hence called for special preparations for Easter. The first mention of a 40 day period of fasting pressure, preparation in preparation of Easter is found in the canons of Nicaea. You know, there were different councils that the church would hold and one of the most important canons in the council was the Council of Nicaea, the canons of Nicaea, which was in AD 325, after the death of our Lord Jesus in the year 325. It is thought that the tradition might have, might have grown from the early church practice of baptismal candidates undergoing a 40-day period of fasting in preparation for the baptism at Easter. So brothers and sisters, what is to happen is that whoever wanted to convert to Christianity were told during the 40 days of fasting to do 40 days of fasting and on the Easter night they would be converted to Christianity. Even now the church follows the same custom. So whoever wants to convert to Christianity on Easter Sunday on the Midnight Mass especially, we find a lot of people being converted. And also on Easter night, for the Midnight Mass, we have the renewal of the vows of our 
baptismal vows every year, which is every year we do it. We remember this. Eventually, the season evolved into a period of spiritual devotion for the whole church. During the initial centuries, now this is after 8325, after the death of our Lord, the year 325 onwards, the Lenten fast was very strict. It was very strict, but it was relaxed over the period of time due to the industrial revolution. With the industrial revolution, it means when the factories started coming up and people were required to work long hours. People were, there were no breaks and they were required to do manual jobs. They were required to sweat and work hard. And people could not fast because of this, because of their work requirements. And hence, it was relaxed. But uh, initially, it was very difficult. Up to now, the, the, the Orthodox Christians, the Orthodox Christians are very diligent in their fasting. They do not drink milk, they do not eat eggs. They have absolutely nothing. Sometimes most of them only have bread, plain bread, without uh, yeast and water. Unleavened bread as they call it and they do it for all the entire 40 days. Even our Catholic Church was like that, but because of the Industrial Revolution, so these, these uh, relaxations came about. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas used to say that we have to fast from midnight to the ninth hour of the next day. Now, what does the ninth hour of the next day mean? Which is the ninth hour? When did Jesus die? Which hour did Jesus die? Yeah. So that is the ninth hour. That is the that is the ninth hour of the day. Princess says no meat and even eggs, flour, or oil would be allowed. Fasting was instituted by the church in order to bring control and to discipline the desires of the flesh which regard pleasure of touch in connection with food and sex. The church forbade those who fast to avoid foods which give most pleasure to the palate. What is pleasure to the palate? The tasting, the, the tasting of our tongue. And besides, were a very great way of inciting lust. The flesh of animals and those that breathe the air and their products such as milk and eggs from birds were not allowed as they afford greater pleasure as food and greater nourishment to the human body so that from their consumption there results a greater surplus available for seminal matter which becomes a great incentive to lust. So brothers and sisters, what happens when we eat animals? When we eat animals like beef, pork, especially the red meats or red fish and things like that or eggs and all that, it creates great desire in our body. It makes our blood hot and it drives many people into lust. And that is the human tendency. And so that is why the church required people to stay away from all this. So hot-blooded animals, food, generally provide more pleasure. St. Thomas Aquinas associates pleasure from food to pleasure from sex. Now St. Jerome would say, you know, St. Jerome, one of the greatest, one of the great doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas is, what, do you know about who St. Thomas Aquinas is? Anyone? Who is St. Thomas Aquinas? Being a Catholic, you should know something about the Catholic Church, no? He is one of the greatest theologians of the Catholic Church. He is one of the greatest theologians. And when uh, there are candidates who study, uh, who learn to become priests in the seminaries, they have to learn compulsorily his theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Much of the theology that they learn is from St. Thomas Aquinas. And who is St. Jerome? one of the greatest doctors of the church, one of the greatest builders of the church, the person responsible for the Holy Bible, to put, for putting together the Holy Bible. He is the one who put the Holy Bible. There were a lot of different books. 
There were a lot of manuscripts which were available and he is the one who in consultation with the Pope that time saw that which book would go in the Bible and which book would go out of the Bible. In fact, uh, they say the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelations, there was a toss-up between that and the book of Enoch. There's another book called the book of Enoch, which is available in the Coptic churches. In the Coptic churches, but is not in our church, in the Catholic church. But uh, they say that uh, St. Jerome almost wanted to put that one and and not include the book of Revelations, the book of Apocalypse. But in the end, he included the book of Apocalypse, the book of Revelations, and uh, he omitted the book of uh, Enoch. Now, St. Jerome would say that lust loses its heat through spanners of food and drink. He would say that lust loses its heat Prosperous of food and drink, that the mind may more freely raise itself to contemplation of more important things than the base desires. Rather, through sacrifice of such foods, rise to a higher spiritual level. We read in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. At that time, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three weeks. I eaten no rich food no meat or wine had entered my mouth and I had not anointed myself at all for the full three weeks on the 24th day of the first month as I was standing on the bank of the great river. So Francis says, we find in the book of Daniel that Daniel fasted for three weeks, three weeks he fasted because he wanted a revelation from God and after that he reveals, he gets a revelation from God. Brothers and now regarding fasting, Saint Augustine would say, also another great doctor of the church, Saint Augustine would say that fasting purifies the soul, it lifts up the mind and brings the body into subjection to the spirit. It makes the heart contrite and humble, scatters the clouds of desire puts out the flame of lust and brings the true light of chastity. So that is what St. Augustine would give the reason, the importance of fasting because it would bring the true light of chastity. Hence we can understand that through fasting we would fulfill the two objectives. One is the destructive of sin and two the lifting of mind to higher things, more important things. So fasting is very important so that we do not give in to temptations. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, we have to remember that Jesus himself was tempted. Saint Gregory the Great says that our Redeemer, quote, our Redeemer who had come on earth to be killed should will to be tempted was not unworthy of him. It was indeed just that he should overcome our temptations by his own in the same way that he had come to overcome our death by his own." Unquote. To warn us that no man, however holy, should think himself safe and free from temptation. Princesses, if you read the life of saints, you find that each and every saint was tempted. Some were tempted during their early <coughs> point of their life, some were pointed, uh, tempted in the middle of their life, some were tempted during the end of their life and some, most of them, were tempted throughout their life, right to the, right the time of their death. So, brothers and sisters, nobody should think, no human being should think that they are holy enough, that they can, that they are safe and free from temptation. We have to always watch for the devil who is come, who is going to come with us with temptations, all kinds of temptations. Saint Hilary says, the devil's wiles are especially directed to travels at times, when we have recently been made holy. So sometimes, especially now after you go from the retreat, maybe the devil will come behind you because the Holy Spirit is trying to, the Holy Spirit is trying to enter you and so the devil will make sure that he cannot enter you. 
Because the devil desires no victory so much as a victory over the world of grace. So he would not allow the grace of God to penetrate you, to enter inside you. St. Augustine would say, Christ gave himself to the devil to be tempted, that in the matter of our overcoming those same temptations, he might be of service, not only by himself, but by his example too. Many people come to the princesses who are in the sin of flesh and tell us that despite of prayer, that they are still getting tempted greatly. Many people who are, some of them in adultery, some especially, mostly in the sin of watching pornography or masturbation especially. Now please remember that fasting from meats, milk, eggs, cheese, sugar, etc., eating boiled foods and foods such as vegetables, lean and white fish will greatly help you in avoiding the sins of the flesh such as fornication, masturbation, adultery, etc. So if you want to get away from this sin of if you want to get away from this sin of um, adultery or masturbation, get on a, a diet of vegetables such as leafy vegetables, avoid maybe something like beans, like um, red beans or kidney beans, try to eat white fish as much as possible, try to avoid meats like pork and beef and uh, <coughs> you know that will greatly help you in not arousing the flesh in you because we are half flesh we are half flesh and we are half uh, spirit. We are spiritual, carne spiritual. So half carne, carne is nothing but uh, flesh and spiritual means spirit. So when we avoid this kind of foods, it helps us more to boost our spirit, to pray and to put down the desires of the flesh. Francis is coming back to Lent. Another important aspect of Lent along with prayer and fasting is alms giving. Now many of us, like, you know, we like to pray and many of us also has made a habit of fasting. But alms giving, many people find it difficult. Find it difficult in the sense that uh, you tend to judge people. We tend to judge people. You know that there are a lot of, lot of poor beggars coming around, like in the early years. And now we find a lot of outsiders, migrants, coming as beggars. And that's when we will start. This one is a ganti and you know, we are coming here to rob and this and that. But how do you know it is not Jesus who has come in the form of a ganti? How do you know it is not the Lord or an angel of God? Like how they came in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, there were angels who came as men. And those men wanted to grab them and have sex with them. So brothers and sisters, we never know who is what. And it might, it might be the Lord Himself who is testing us. So remember that alms giving is very, very important. And where we don't judge people, where we provide material generosity to the less fortunate. What we can give is money, goods, acts of charity, like for example, helping others with their work. Even that also is an act of charity. If you know that there is someone who is living alone or they are old and they cannot do their basic things like paying their bills, you can help them or like taking someone to the doctor or to the hospital. You can help by clothing the poor, giving them clothes and whatever. But be careful of not giving your junk and trash. Many people what they do is they remove all the unwanted things from the house and try to give to the poor and think they are doing something great. Maybe torn clothes, maybe stained clothes, worn out clothes, which will be again be thrown out, right? And many, most people, and many of these uh, orphanages, when we have gone to them and visited them, many of the nuns used to tell us who run the orphanages or the people who run the orphanages that they get so much of rubbish and junk, and that uh, the girls living there, they don't want to use them. So don't give all your rubbish and your junk and your trash. Give something which someone can use. And but this is our late Pope uh, Emeritus, uh, Pope uh, late uh, Benedict XVI would say regarding almsgiving. 
Arms giving represents a specific way to assist those in need and at the same time an exercise in self-denial to free us from attachment to worldly goods. Many of us and many people, they want all the money that they have only for themselves. Many people find it very difficult to part away with even little bit of what they got. People like to keep storing and storing. So it helps us when we give something to others, it helps us to be to make it an act of self denial. It helps us not to be selfish. It helps us to be not attached to this world and to these worldly things. Almsgiving helps us to overcome this constant temptation, teaching us to respond to our neighbor's needs and to share with others whatever we possess through divine goodness. Brothers and sisters, almsgiving is, all, is among what are known as the corporal works of mercy, consisting especially in feeding, now these are the following works of mercy, corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned, and bearing the dead. Now among all this, alms to the poor, giving almsgiving, is the most important. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, Jesus says, Freely we have received, freely give. It is by what we have done for the poor that God will recognize His chosen ones. And in Matthew chapter 5, again Jesus says, Give to him who begs from you, do not refuse him who would borrow from you. Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen.